first, uh, thanks to Rich and to Bjorn for organizing the session and for um, inviting me to be a part of it. I'm, I'm really happy to be here and have a chance to share with you guys some of the data we've collected over the last few years that I'm going to suggest um, implies a possible neural mechanism by which the cerebellum might contribute to reward-based learning. So, much of what we know about the neural basis of cerebellar learning really comes from a study of a handful of behaviors uh, in animal models, and some of the most important uh, behaviors are listed here. These learning paradigms tend to be modifications of innate behaviors. And what they taught us uh, is that inputs from uh, the inferior olive-compliant fibers, the synapse of the dendrites of Purkinje cells, are triggered by errors in movement. Okay. And what they do is they produce this regenerative calcium spike in the dendrites of Purkinje cells that can serve to instruct heterosynaptic plasticity and, in particular, long term synaptic depression that's sought to then weaken the output of the cortex and correct uh, subsequent movements. But, um, you know, it's, it's clear that this error signaling model uh, does well to describe the neural data that's been collected in the confines of behavior such as these. But we also know that the cerebellum uh, likely contributes to learning that is not guided by motor errors. And in fact, might be guided by predictions about uh, upcoming reward. We also know that the cerebellum connects to downstream structures such as the VTA and the striatum that are involved in reward-based learning. And so our question really is, by what neural mechanism might the cerebellum contribute to learning that's not guided by motor errors? And in particular, uh, in such paradigms, what would these climbing fibers uh, be doing? And how might they uh, provide a meaningful instructional signal to guide them? Okay? So today I'm going to show you uh, data where we're using the passive imaging and climbing fiber input to pertain to cells in the context of two different tasks. The first of which is an operant uh, task in which mice are trained to execute a voluntary forward movement, the second of which is an appetitive classical conditioning task. Okay, so here's the first behavior. We're using mice, they're headsets, and they are seated in front of a uh, lever, a video monitor. And what we're doing the mice to do is to press the lever at a time of their choosing, and we're viewing a vertical gradient on this monitor, and their job is simply to wait until that vertical gradient changes 90 degrees horizontal, at which point they have one second to release the lever for a sugar water reward. And the task comes with two flavors, the first of which uh, we randomize the delay interval from when the animals push the lever to when the release cue instructs um, them to release the lever. And when we do this, we find that uh, the animals adopt a reaction strategy whereby if we plot the time of lever release in the black dots against the trial number um, uh, relative to the time when the cue changes orientation, you can see that there's this uh, constant reaction time that simply reflects the amount of time necessary for sensory motor integration if the animal is see the visual cue and release a lot. Okay? But um, when we instead fix the time on every trial between when the animal puts the lever down and the release cue occurs, there has to be a form of learning whereby animals start to adjust their reaction time to approximate the time the visual cue changes its orientation. And this learning occurs over the course of a few hundred trials. So these are single sessions, here's population average. Uh, you can see that animals adjust the reaction time by a couple hundred milliseconds over a few hundred trials when they fix the cue delay at short intervals, but they exhibit no learning when we randomize the cue delay. Okay? Uh, notably, animals learn well in this paradigm when the cue delay is short, and by short I mean a few hundred milliseconds. They learn poorly when the cue delay is longer, greater than a second. For those familiar with other cerebellar dependent learning paradigms, this sort of uh, learning curve should look familiar. And for example, conditioned eye blink experiments, you see the same temporal dependence of learning. It tends to be a hallmark of uh, cerebellar sensory motor associations, and it gives us some confidence, I think, that the cerebellum might be involved in this task. But better evidence comes uh, from this experiment where we've used synaptic transmission blockers into a very specific region of the cerebellum, and I'll show you momentarily. When we did this, we were able to compare learning on our task without comparing the animal's ability to manipulate the lever. Okay, so this task gives us two versions, one of which we can study the neural activity that is available to drive learning without allowing learning to occur, and then in the second uh, version of the task, we can study how the neural signals in the cerebellum change as a function of learning. 
Today I'm going to show you data from this version of the task with the goal of telling you what the climbing fibers are doing or what signals are available to drive them. Uh, we're going to use uh, in vivo calcium imaging to visualize the inputs from climbing fibers to the dendrites of Purkinje cells. As I mentioned, they produce a large generative calcium spike in these dendrites, and that's ideal for two, two photon uh, calcium imaging. Um, uh, an example of which is shown here, we're collecting at 30 hertz, and you can see that the uh, complex spikes or the climbing fiber input produces these calcium transients in the dendrites, which appear at cross section. We validated that these are in fact uh, climbing fiber inputs using electrophysiology. So uh, we're going to be looking at a very specific region of the cerebellum here near the dorsal surface of the lobule simplex. This is an area where we have um, we've optogenetically mapped the dorsal surface of the cerebellum, and we uh, empirically identified a region here which is causally related to the production of forelimb movements. In other words, when we hit the Purkinje cells here, we can drive the ipsilateral forelimb movements. And in this very specific region, when we use a uh, glutamate receptor antagonists uh, locally, we can impair the animal's ability to learn in our past without impairing their ability to manipulate the lever. So this is where we're going to be looking at the climate fiber. <coughs> okay, so that's what we did. And um, uh, the initial result that we found is shown here, the population average. What we've done now is subdivide trials in our task according to their outcome. So here is the uh, animal has correctly timed its movement. Here, when the animal has mistimed its movement, and by that I mean correctly released the lever in response to the visual cue, or incorrectly released the lever prematurely, uh, and here's where the animal presses the lever, and what you think what's immediately evident is that there are many more activity cells receiving climbing fiber input when animals correctly time their movement, much more so than when animals mistime their movements. Uh, this result held true across a large number of experiments where you can see that there's a much larger fraction of the kinky cells receiving input from the climbing fibers when animals correctly time their movements. This is population average. We can also look at the level of individual Purkinje cell dendrites with this method. Uh, and that's what's shown here, which is the selected one. And what you can see is that when we average across trials, uh, this particular Purkinje cell dendrite exhibits a very large calcium transient. For correctly timed movements, uh, it's significantly greater than uh, when the animals mistimed their movements or when they press their lever. Again, a finding that held true across a large number of observations. So, um, what I've told you so far is that we can train mice to press the lever and release in response to a visual cue, and when this cue delay is fixed, the animals adjust their reaction time to anticipate it, and this, this learning depends on the region. Uh, Forelimb region of the lobule simplex, but what's really, uh, what was really surprising to us and, and completely unanticipated is that we observed significantly uh, enhanced responses from the climbing fibers where animals are correctly timing their movements. Okay, and this is this is really not consistent uh, in our view with our signaling motor errors. So the next thing we wanted to do was try to figure out what's going on with these climbing fibers and how in the cerebellum. Um, the uh, mundane explanations we wanted to check first were that perhaps this, this difference in neural activity has something to do with differences in movement kinematics um, between trial types, between uh, uh, correctly timed movements and mistimed movements. That's not the case. Uh, what I'm showing you here are lever trajectories for an example session where an animal correctly timed or mistimed its movements, and they're identical. Uh, as they were on the population average. Uh, I can tell you we do have the resolution to detect uh, differences in movement in different animals have very different kinematics. Uh, but I think it's not surprising that the kinematics are, are the same on, uh, on these two trial types because the animals are highly overtrained at this point. Their, their movements, they've been learning this task for over a month, their movements uh, within animals are incredibly serious. Uh, the next thing we wondered was whether or not there was seeing some difference in neural activity or the difference in motor output due to licking. Uh, we're not in an area that's known to be causally related to lick or, uh, licking, but uh, of course, when an animal correctly times its movement, it gets a reward and it licks more than if it doesn't get a reward. That's indicated here in this uh, histogram of lick rates where you can see the lick rate shoots up to almost 10 hertz and persists for a couple of seconds when animals correctly time their movements, and that's not true when they mistime their movements. But if you look at the amplitude of calcium transients as a function of lick rate for either mistimed movements or correctly timed movements, we find the correlation thus suggesting that it's not the case that we're seeing uh, a difference owing to uh, motor output due to licking. Okay, so uh, at this point, I think we've 
uh, shown the, the climbing fiber is no single um, motor errors. And now the, the job becomes uh, to figure out what they, uh, what, what, they, what they do signal. And at this point, we sort of think that perhaps we're seeing some sort of uh, reward prediction signal. Because of course, in our task, uh, correctly timed movement is an accurate predictor of upcoming reward. And so we went back to the data and looked for evidence uh, to test this hypothesis. And the first thing we noticed uh, was that if we look at the amplitude of calcium transients as a function of the amount of time that the animal held the lever down, we noticed that for correctly timed movements, there's a, the amplitude is large and invariant, but for mistimed movements, you see that the amplitude of the calcium transients scales with the amount of time that the animal has held the lever down. Uh, now, you know, what we notice about this scaling is that it's consistent with uh, 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 the hazard function imposed by a trial structure, namely that reward becomes more and more probable with time because there's a finite amount of time after which the, the visual cue that starts to release can, uh, cannot occur anymore. It has to occur sometime between half a second and four and a half seconds. So one possible interpretation of these data is that when the animal uh, sees the visual cue and correctly releases the lever, its expectation of reward is uniformly high, whereas when the animal mistimes its movement, uh, its, its uh, expectation of reward scales with the probability of reward delivery imposed by our trial structure. So what we want to do is have a look at these calcium transients where animals held the lever down for a short time and mistimed their movements, or a long time and mistimed their movements. And we found, in fact, that they look quite different. So when animals uh, uh, held the lever down for a short time, the response had this kind of mon monophasic uh, shape, but it had the second uh, clear response when animals um, uh, held the lever down for a longer time period and put this time of movements. And you can see that even on uh, single trials, indicating that it's not some artifact of averaging responses with two different timings. You see here that this uh, late phase occurs uh, at the moment where lick rates start to decrease and the animal has clearly realized that no reward is being delivered. And so in our interpretation, uh, uh, this is consistent at least with the idea that we're seeing some form of a uh, reward prediction or prediction error signal whereby when the animal's expectation that it should be rewarded for having held the lever down for a long time is violated, we see this second round of timing fiber activity. <coughs> to further test this hypothesis, we designed a second experiment uh, in which we omitted reward on a subset of trials where it should have been given because the animals correctly released the lever in response to the visual stimulus. And I was shocked when I saw this, but in fact we see exactly the same thing, uh, which is this late phase of a response that's evident even uh, <laughs> on single trials. Uh, it occurs at the moment when the grades go down. So, uh, to us, these data are most consistent with an interpretation that what we're seeing is some form of a reward prediction signal here. And I say that because, uh, along with other pieces of evidence I don't have time to show you, we're seeing that climbing fiber input is triggered by lever releases that uh, predict that kind of reward. These would be correctly timed movements. They're consistent with longer lever hold times, where reward expectation uh, is necessarily higher than going through the trial structure, and it's triggered by a limited reward when expectation is high as instructed by visual cue. So, um, it, to us, this was incredibly surprising, and uh, it led us to start to wonder uh, why we're seeing these responses. Do we somehow walk into a particular region of the cerebellum where climbing fibers are capable of signaling the word prediction errors? Or are they more ubiquitous, for example, across the lateral cerebellum that connects to the region such as BTA spray and the middle cortex? And furthermore, what dependence do these kind of responses have on the particular task that we give the animal? In our task, the animal's got to execute a movement in order to uh, determine the trial outcome in order to get reward. Is that a necessary feature to see these? Responses. So the next thing we did was design a second behavior uh, that has, that's a little bit different, um, uh, which is a classical conditioning task uh, of the type typically used to study reward processing in uh, structures such as the BPA. <laughs> so now the task is similar but different in, a, in one key way. The animal is sitting in front of the video monitor and it's viewing the same uh, vertical grading but we're taking the lever away. And so now what happens is that after a long and variable IPI, uh, the Q 
queue comes, so there's a delay interval of a few hundred milliseconds, and then reward is delivered. And um, to be clear, in this uh, task, the animal doesn't have to do anything for the reward to be delivered. It has to lick to collect the reward, but whether it does or doesn't has no bearing on the outcome of the trial. So uh, what I'm showing you here are the lick rates for a uh, population of naive animals on the first day of training. And what you see is that the visual cue changes orientation, the word is delivered, after some delay the animal starts licking, once it realizes there's a drop of uh, liquid. Uh, but when we omit the word on a subset of trials, uh, what you find is that there's no licking because visual cue doesn't mean anything. Uh, however, after five to seven days of training, these animals now can uh, match their lick rates really nicely to the time when uh, reward is delivered, and they lick even when reward is omitted, indicating to us that they now understand the meaning of the visual stimulus that predicts upcoming reward. So now we look at climbing fiber activity uh, in the context of this task, and uh, we're back in Lago Simplex where. Previously, again, this is resonance scanning, two photon imaging, and the simplicity of turned everything into spike rates to so look at various single time instagrams. The left column is going to be naive animals, and the right column is going to be the same population of animals after having been trained on the task. What you note is that um, in the naive animals, there's this robust response to unexpected reward on the first day of training, but nothing on the mission trials. And remarkably, after training, you now see a response. Um, that is, uh, in fact, driven by the visual cue that predicts reward, even on reward emission trials, and we've disambiguated this as well from, from licking response. Now, notably, we don't really see very much here on uh, reward emission trials, and that's something I'm going to circle back to in just uh, a couple slides here at the very end to discuss. But moving on, we wanted to have a look here now at other regions of the lateral cerebellum, and so we move one module further on to uh, Chris one. And here, in some ways, things are very different. Uh, in naive animals, we see a response uh, to the visual cue. So now we've got sensory responses in naive animals. Uh, but you'll note that the response is enhanced once the animals learn the meaning of the visual cue for its upcoming reward. Finally, moving over to Chris 2, which is about as far as we can go um, with our imaging technique before the cerebellum kind of wraps around too far for us to get to. And you can see that uh, there's, uh, similar to simplex, there's this response to unexpected reward in naive animals and a learned response to the cue that predicts reward in trained animals. Uh, but here, uh, notably, the reward response is enhanced. So there's some difference across these areas, as you might necessarily expect. But what's common is that in all three areas, you see a learned response to a cue that predicts upcoming reward. Okay. We also looked at unexpected reward after learning. <coughs> Uh, you can see that there's an enhanced unexpected reward response in uh, uh, lobule simplex. Chris one has a response to unexpected reward. This was incredibly surprising to us to see this in the learned condition. Uh, I say that because if I just go back one slide here, there was no response in naive animals to unexpected reward, nor to expected reward in trained animals. Only after the animal has learned that reward should necessarily be predicted by this visual cue do you see responses when it's delivered unexpectedly. Uh, and in Chris 2, where the reward response is maintained, you now see that it is enhanced if that reward was not expected. So what I've shown you here in the second task is that uh, after learning uh, the condition stimulus drives primal fiber input, I always argue that this is consistent with some form of a learned reward prediction, if not strictly a reward prediction error. Uh, uh, climbing fiber signal unexpected reward differentially from expected reward, again, expected, uh, again, consistent with some form of reward prediction, and even with, I think, a, a reward prediction error. What's not in this, uh, consistent with RPE is that we don't see anything uh, significant, either positive or negative, when we omit uh, the reward on this trial, on this uh, task. And I would just make a couple of points here, the first of which is that we're looking immediately after learning. In other brain structures where people see RPE, uh, it tends to be the case that you've got to overtrain the animals a little bit for that to come out, as we did in the first task, and so that might be a key difference here. It's also true that our task is very different in the sense that the animals don't have to execute a movement in order to influence trial outcome in places like uh, the striatum that's thought to be a key feature for sometimes seeing these RPE signals. But we don't know, and we still have work to do to figure out what's different uh, between these two tasks uh, in this regard. 
But what's similar, and what I just want to leave you with, is that both paths show the kind of high risk and signal events that predict that kind of reward. Okay? And to me, this suggests that uh, climate fiber activity is well situated to drive motor learning. And in fact, you don't need any learning, and not necessarily motor learning, via reward prediction. Uh, and to me, this suggests that the cerebellum might be able to learn reward based associations, possibly then contributing to reward based learning via the connections we know it has to downstream structures such as the VTA instrument. All right, so I just want to finish by thanking uh, all the people that actually did this work, because I didn't do any of it. Um, uh, my first graduate student, uh, Jake Hefley, is really the lead on this, and he did all of the imaging across both of these tasks. Uh, but all of these people contributed significantly to the work. Um, and I just want to thank all the people in my lab, as well as in uh, another lab, uh, that's a good colleague who was critical for helping us get the imaging going. Uh, I just want to thank Joshua, got the initial project off the ground. Uh, and the funding sources with that, I will happily take questions.